perhaps could just briefly introduce themselves. Um, so yeah, let's start with uh, Ole. Yes, hello. <clears throat> hello, Andrew. Hello, everybody. So, so uh, I'm, I, my name is Ole Thompson, as we said already. I am at University of Bristol. I'm, I'm the NCC Chair of Composites uh, Design and Manufacture. So I have a joint position with the National Composite Center in Bristol and the Bristol Composites Institute. Uh, you introduced the, 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 the panel members as, as experts in experimental mechanics. I don't think I am one. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm involved with a lease project that where there's a very large element of experimental mechanics as well as computational mechanics. So I probably sit here or could contribute here as somebody who tried to bring things together. Okay, thank you very much, Ole. Um, Fabrice. Yes, I think a uh, lot of people around this virtual table will, uh, will know me, but I'm a professor of uh, solid mechanics at the University of Southampton. Um, I've uh, pretty much done most of my career in, in experimental mechanics, even though I had a, a very early life in composite materials. Um, but um, very early on, I decided to dedicate my research to the use of camera-based system to map measurements, um, to map deformation, and um, design new test methodologies based on this, uh, this rich information. So that's, um, that's the angle uh, from which I will be, um, I, I will be approaching uh, the future of experimental mechanics. Thank you very much, Fabrice. Um, Johan? Um, I'm Jonas Nagels from the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. And I actually have a background in physics, applied physics, plasma deposition, so thin films being used in the semiconductor industry. So nothing to do with mechanics. But then I made a, a switch to become, um, at that time, assistant professor in um, experimental mechanics and then mechanical engineering. Um, and um, so I've, I've, from, I've always focused really on the micro mechanics. Um, uh, so integration of, of micro mechanical testing with uh, microscopic visualization. So all kinds of microscopes, trying to see what's going on on the small scales, but also um, a strong coupling with numerical simulations. Where in our section, there's a lot of um, effort uh, in, into developing numerical models like multi-scale models, RVE type of models molecular dynamic simulations. So trying to really understand uh, micromechanics on small scales. So that's, that's gonna be my angle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johanna. And last but by no means least, Genevieve. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, yeah, my name is Genevieve Langdon. I'm professor of blast and impact engineering at the University of Sheffield. And before I was there, I spent 15 years at the University of Cape Town. Um, before that, I was at Liverpool where I did my PhD in undergraduate um, I'm not really, someone would call themselves a, a, an experimental mechanics expert either. Um, my interest comes from structural response to explosions. And in that field, we're generally quite bad at measuring strain um, compared to the kind of quality of presentations I've seen here. Uh, but about 10 years ago, we scratched our heads and realized that optical diagnostics were probably the way forward in our field as well. Um, and, and so that's the angle that I'm coming from uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Okay, um, so I will um, probably remain quiet, but I'll try and guide the conversation if it needs it. But um, so perhaps we should start with a, a question. Let's look into our crystal balls. Um, so now that we have full field surface and volumetric measurements of strain by a, a wide variety of techniques, um, has the golden era passed? And what is the next big challenge in experimental mechanics? What do we think? Okay, I could start on that if you want, um, Andrew. Um, what, what you, uh, I mean, this, what you say, this question is true. We, um, we have now a variety of, of techniques. When I, I did my PhD, I was sticking strain gauges madly everywhere. Um, and, um, and then very quickly we started playing with these first CCD cameras. I mean, they were not very good. They didn't have a lot of spatial resolution, um, but, um, but it was a bit like recovering sight, really, when we, we saw this, this first uh, deformation maps. Um, and that has followed me uh, all along my career. I must admit that it's, taking, it's taken much longer than I anticipated for these methods 
to um, to diffuse widely within the academic and and um, industrial communities. But I think we're more or less reaching this point now. So um, with the um, international efforts through the IDIC Society, for instance, to um, um, to, to issue guides of good practice and, um, and through training and certification, we're gradually getting there. These techniques are, are now mature. However, I think what is really missing is how we use these methods um, in, um, in engineering widely. If you look at um, material testing, for instance, which is a, a big hobby of mine, um, pretty much all test standards at the moment are based on metrology that was um, developed uh, decades ago, strain gauges, extensometer. There's nothing at the moment that um, takes full advantage of uh, the incredible amount of data we now have with, with measurements. And I think the effort now is how we translate these tools, we invent the engineering that goes with that. And there's a lot of communication with, with the simulation, and I think we'll certainly discuss that later. But we need to push new standards, for instance, for, for material testing that take full advantage of uh, these, these new methods. So um, you talk about the golden age. I think the golden age is starting because we've invented the, the hammer and the saw now, and, and, and now we can invent carpentry. And um, there's probably a, a few decades of, um, of research and development to make sure that these tools uh, are, are fully transferred in, in the engineering cycle. If I can come in there and say, I think Fabrice is absolutely right. Uh, we see it on the structural side as well, where we've got design standards for materials like concrete and steel, which are really bad from an embodied carbon perspective. And we need to start translating that over into new materials with much better guidance so that construction industries can adapt them. And I think what we're going to see more and more is experimental mechanics experts are going to need to be able to work with multidisciplinary teams and start looking at these issues from, from systems levels, whether it's transportation or energy production or infrastructure. Well, I agree with what you, what you both are saying. Um, I would, would like to take a, a bit of a different angle because, um, so yeah, maybe it, if you look purely at the techniques uh, for, for strain mapping, they are very well developed. And also now you can see them uh, being more developed also towards uh, the, the, the micron scale, really seeing all what's, what's happening at the, at the microstructural level. Um, but I think there's a huge future um, and that we're really just only starting to explore in terms of stress mapping. It's sort of like the other side of the coin. Um, and there are techniques coming from, from this. So like high resolution um, electron backscatter diffraction so the, um, and that up to, to, to this point, it's, it's, a, it's really only it's a relative. So you can relatively map the stress with, a, to, with respect to a point where, of which you know the stress and that limits the technique completely. But there's future coming to, to make this absolute. Um, and uh, there are new developments in the field. Um, this is a very exciting field there where really the fundamentals are being explored of how this can be done so that you would really in a microstructure directly just get a full map of the, at each point you get the stress as, as you get the strain today. Um, but there, there's also um, uh, a technique that, that, that just recently was proposed actually by, by a student of mine, uh, Jem Tassan at, uh, and, and co-worker uh, co ben, ben Cameron at MIT, um, where they also do a full stress mapping, but they use only the knowledge that from a strain that the principal direction of the strain are equal to the principal direction of the stress. And if you then look at the equations, then you can actually, uh, <laughs> grasping from a boundary condition where you know it, you can get the full stress uh, um, profile. And that's also, I think, has a huge future for, uh, for it. And then there are techniques we've been looking, well, we've already been trying to explore for years in terms of inverse methodologies, but they also have a lot of limitations and, and complexities. And, but all, also there you can get the stress basically out. Uh, there, uh, I see many different, um, yeah. And, and on top of this, you, you get in 3D, you get um, um, uh, synchrotron type of techniques where they also get locally in 3D, uh, also with a lot of limitations, you can get uh, a 3D stress mapping. But I would say the last category is probably 
or will never be like a common type of, of technique. But these first two, they could really easily develop into techniques that, that in, in 20 years, um, people would be would have a sa same type of panel discussion, but then saying, okay, we, we, we've, discussed, we've discovered everything about stress mapping, how to go forward. But now at this point, there's nothing there, almost nothing there, I would say. If I, if I can contribute to the discussion, so I'm coming from, from a, a, a large structures angle, of, so sizable structural components as well. And, and one of the things I, I see is still clearly missing. So yes, we have uh, full field imaging techniques, uh, volumetric measurement techniques very, coming from various methodologies, uh, but we, we, we lack the ability to, to use them fast. So very often you would want to, we would want to, to capture that data and process it almost, almost uh, uh, say in situ and live, so real time. And uh, because only then can we really use it for monitoring purposes, really understand the state of, of, uh, of, of the structure. So the health, uh, you, you might say also for quality assessments online. Uh, so for instance, being able to, yes, we can, we can do volumetric uh, imaging and so on, but it takes an awful lot of time. And, uh, and it's something you can do when the process is over. It's, it's very difficult to do it in situ. So, so, so significant progress in doing this much, much faster, I think, is needed for this to be really fulfilling the, the potential that it has. Uh, we have models that, that, to a large extent, at least reduced order models that can, can, that can, that can work almost real time for very large systems. And we can, we can then stop and have a look with, with various techniques, but we can't do it in, in real time or at the same speed. So I think that that would be an area where I would look to. And I see what we're doing right now, you see the companies on large scale structures and are looking for is that kind of ability to, to benchmark predictions and, all, and to validate predictions as well. I think we're facing the same challenges with explosion loading and how to measure the response and how to use the response to get an idea of what the loading is. Because you can't very easily measure the loading with pressure gauges and, and temperature sensors, um, but you could measure it from the response that you're seeing on a structure. And so the adaptation of the techniques that I've been listening to here into an extreme loading environment is something that, that I think is certainly in the short term a next feature step for us. In a way, that's interesting because we 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 live in a little bit like a, like a closed community in experimental mechanics. It's a very small community, and um, there are a lot of interesting things to do at the interface between uh, experimental mechanics and, and other communities. I mean, we, we've seen the talk um um this morning um by by sam evans uh, on what you could do in terms of, um, of bio applications and a lot of people um working in this area where they have a lot of imaging um uh, capabilities uh, but there are also other areas where um um these uh, technologies haven't really penetrated that much and um i think you're right Genevieve, the, 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 the this one is one of them but there are others where um i think we might be able to do better uh, I think I discussed during the conference at some stage, we're talking about tribology, for instance, and there hasn't actually been that much. Also because obviously op optical access is difficult when you have contact and, and that probably explained it. But if you look at vibration, for instance, um, this is another area where these techniques have been slow to penetrate, probably because there are also some sensitivity uh, issues, small deformation, more difficult to capture. Um, but uh, I think there's, there's, there, are, there are a number of communities where um, we could probably interact um, with more to, um, um, to, 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 um, to make these developments uh, happen a bit more fast. To add on uh, this, look, I, I think a very interesting field where we could contribute is actually the measurements of, of um, the, the forces acting on uh, living cells. And uh, so it turns out that, that uh, living cells, the, the way they grow and uh, uh, way, the way they develop and what they do, that depends heavily on the mechanical forces acting on them, exerting, and also the interaction between them. So that uh, in, in a certain field, they, 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 um, they developed already sort of like a methodology where they have a substrate and they, they track basically three-dimensional deformation and uh, in a very coarse way. And I think that, that that's, 
it has such a huge potential in terms of, of screening for cancer cells and these kind of things. Uh, um, but there we could really contribute and really uh, giving high fidelity um, measurements of, of, of the complete stress state of a cell in, the, in its interaction with the substrate. So that's all like close to, to what you're saying with the contact uh, measurement. They, they, these are challenging, but I think they're very much needed. Uh, yeah. So, so another perspective for, for my side. So, so uh, Fabrice mentioned that, uh, that the experimental mechanics community is kind of a niche in some sense, looking at the, uh, for instance, the number of journals publish, uh, publishing uh, uh, experimental method technique development is, 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 sick, is, 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 is small and a number of papers is actually not that big compared to more mainstream topics in mechanics, for instance. And, uh, and I think they allude to the fact that, that's, that uh, in, in many ways, if you look at the, the funding landscape for research, it's driven by challenges, uh, grand challenges, uh, zero carbon, uh, sustainability, and so on. And, and, and experimental mechanics come in as, a, as an enabler to basically support research in those areas to deliver those, those, uh, the, 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 within those, those challenges. So I think the challenge for us is uh, for experimental mechanics community is, is to, 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 be, to be relevant by, 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 being, by being part of, of, uh, of say, uh, attacking those challenges by providing the techniques necessary to, 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 for instance, validate model predictions and so on. So both to up to the beat there. So it's, it's, some, it's that enabling function that probably makes it a little bit hidden for some. And I think that's, that's something we really need to, to address if we want to go forward. Lots of journals are publishing experimental, say, work, but not so much on the method development. I'm, I'm in Journal of Compass Part B, which is published about 700 papers a year. And uh, we receive 7,000 manuscripts a year. And, and uh, a lot of that, the majority of that is an experimental element in it, but it's not the typically method development, it's more the use of a technique. So somehow raise the flag of experimental mechanics and then in, in, the, in those other areas to make sure that actually there is something here to that's necessary to bring the other areas, the grand challenges forward. I think that's 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 kind of a a a, a must for for people in this area. I think another way of thinking about it is we do need penetration into other engineering fields and other areas, but but there's also a um, a global aspect to this where you have the global north for want of a better term that has the technology and, and the economic resources to advance these types of research where the global south is in general not able to access the technology to follow you or, and to access them and, and to take part in that conversation and so I think another challenge that we face because we're seeing with COVID and with the climate change issues facing us, that the whole world is connected, but that some aspects of the world are more affected than others because of these issues of political leadership or expertise or finance or whatever it might be that causes a disproportionate effect upon different people groups, is just how impactful are we upon the lives of others when we're chasing through research impact and not just in the UK, but globally. And with us being online this year, there are people from all over the world in this conversation. Um, and I don't know how we wrestle with that question. And perhaps I'm just more aware of it having come from a South African context for 15 years where you know, trying to keep up with the UK was a challenge. Interesting question. Just a reflection on Jay uh, uh, uh points. So, so looking at the distribution of where, for instance, papers come from for where I'm sitting in composites, you can see there's a significant disparity around the world where the, some, some areas of the globe are almost non-existent in submissions for the journal. So we can see that there's, there's not much going on there, at least it's not being submitted. And uh, the vast majority is North America, Europe, and of course these days China and, and the Far East is a massive uh, over, overarching and anything else really. Whereas uh, South America, Middle America, African continent is almost absent. So, so that, that, general, that certainly is a challenge, not just for experimental mechanics, but for the world, really. It's probably more political than scientific. Um, in, in terms of impact, I think um, we're all facing the, 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 the same thing, really. Is that we're just trying to do things that other people will find useful and that we'll be able to build on 
um, to, to take whatever problem forward. I think we need to be very humble in terms of whatever impact we can make on the world. We might even have more power as, as citizens that we have as, as, um, as scientists, actually, in that respect. Um, so, but yeah, I understand you, you, you certainly, the, the perspective you have with, with, um, with your, your career profile is quite interesting. Um, because as Ole said, we, it's very difficult um, to, to understand what happens in countries where it's a bit like a, a black hole in terms of uh, output to the, um, to, to the scientific effort. You, you don't see anything coming and so you get no idea how, it, or how it's actually working, what are people doing there, what kind of challenges um, uh, thereafter. The only time when I, I, I had a glimpse of that was through um, um, the um, uh, review panel of uh, Royal Society uh, international um, collaboration um, um, uh, proposals or, or Newton fellowships where you see proposals um, that come from, from, from countries that do not necessarily appear on the scientific landscape. Um, and it's quite interesting to see how, you know, you could collaborate um, um, with, uh, with such countries uh, in particular areas. Um, but in my career, I, I've never really been exposed to that. I suppose it leads on to an interesting question about the future of um, funding. And as we've mentioned, COVID, climate change, net zero carbon, um, with a, a lot of uh, uh, funding streams orientated towards or gravitating towards those um, sort of high level topics. Do we think that, that securing funding for the furtherance of uh, experimental mechanics research is going to be a challenge in the future years? Or do we think there's a, a spin on it that uh, I, I, personally, that funding? I, I, I personally don't think that's anything new. It's just that the challenges have shifted. But at least where I, where I come from, my background, I've never seen a program offered in experimental mechanics. I've seen it in, in, uh, in uh, say, uh, uh, ch challenge, ch defined by challenge areas, which, which are related to, to societal ch uh, uh, ch challenges and goals. And, and I think that, that experimental mechanics will have a, a, very, a very happy future existence. By, by tapping into that and arguing the case that actually you cannot make any progress in this, in these areas, unless we also have the experimental side there. The, the things needs to be understood from the, from the fundamental physics. That's what we can do with, with experiment, experiments in a way that we can't do to, to the same extent with the same fidelity with, uh, with, uh, with models in many cases, or in most cases, I would argue. And also models that we more and more believe will be, uh, say, the uh, taking over. That's, by the way, been predicted for the last 30 years since I was, uh, I was in short trials to doing a PhD. And, and still we need experiments to, to, to qualify and, and validate models. So I don't really see that changing dramatically. I think we should not be, was it defeatist and say, oh, it's lost already. They don't understand us because we're, we're experimental mechanics geeks. Stand up to it and get in there and, and, and argue your case, then you'll win. Well, that would challenge to say the line to, to hook on to the last point. I think things like like a recent development in numerical modeling, like data-driven modeling, that, that will require actually much more experimental input, but it doesn't have to be of the same kind. It used to be at classical experiments with with uh, with, with clear boundary conditions and and and, and very simple stress and strain fields and so like the virtual field methods of, of uh, Fabrice, for instance, already to, stepped away from that, that you would just take actually a complex uh, a loading direction. And, um, and uh, so it's, but I think with data-driven modeling that, that, that you, you really see, and also Bayesian inference, uh, these kind of, uh, that, that you will actually see that much more uh, experiments will be taken into account. Um, to, to come on to back to the, the 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 funding environment, I also don't see any difference. Basically, I I was thinking I've I, I I cannot recall any description of a funding scheme that actually had the term experimental mechanics in it. That is uh, that so so I've I've never come across a funding scheme where the the the, the governing body said or something where we were gonna fund experimental mechanics. So the words experimental mechanics, I don't see, think I've ever seen in, 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 and these are sometimes long descriptions of the funding schemes, right? So um, I think it was, for me at least, I've, I've always, uh, the, the, 
there was always the, the need to, to, to go for societal impact. And then you bring along your experimental techniques because you, you need to develop and uh, develop these in order to, um, to, to provide actually the, the, the information and data that, that, uh, that we need in order to develop, for instance, new materials in order to reach those uh, societal impact. So it's always more like, in, uh, like I said before, that, that we provide a service in, in a way. Um, and so we're re it's not the, the, the direct impact. It, it's, uh, well, it's, it's, it's really through a chain, I would say. So really we can, we can contribute to, for instance, making new materials or better structures. And then other others have to, to sort of like uh, make a better impact with that. But it's kind of interesting, I think, that, that I've never read the words experimental mechanics in the, in the funding scheme description. Yeah, I think experimental mechanics requires a, an imagination, not it requires it for working out what its impact is so that it can bring in the funding to support the development of the, of the techniques and also the imagination for what that, those techniques can be and how you can either apply new ones, change them, develop something completely different or adapt existing technology. Um, uh, whereas we can often get very bogged down in the technical detail of, of the technique or the coding that we're using to, to analyze or whatever it might be. And so you talked about the future of experimental mechanics partly around funding, but it's also around that making sure that that when we're training the next generation, that they appreciate that that's part of the role of an experimental mechanics researcher, is this translation and this research imagination that they need to have that is bigger than their own project. Yeah, I think uh, like once you stop writing the project proposals, you, you very quickly learn this, but I guess students, even these, these students don't, don't, don't see this often. I try, sometimes try to draw them into uh, into the process of a project of the writing of a project proposal, and uh, it opens their eyes. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. You have really different type of discussions, but uh, yeah, indeed. Well, there's certainly much more political control these days on the scientific agenda than there used to be, um, and so now um, pretty much everywhere, and I, I could see that develop throughout my career, where. Um, you know, it's more and more targeted, so more and more control, direct control uh, from governments um, on the research themes and, and you know, where, what you should be doing or where you should be going. I mean, uh, everyone remembers the era of the carbon nanotubes in the, in, the, in the US, right, where if you wanted to have funding, you, have to have, you had to have carbon nanotubes somewhere in your proposal. Then it, it was graphene and whatever, and, and then now it's grand challenges or whatever. Now, I think this shows just the, the um, willingness, the... the um, um, need for governments to feel in control of the research efforts um, to be used for political advantage. And I think that's probably what has changed in the landscape. Now, if you look at experimental mechanics, there's, there's, um, um, there's a very big difference between the US and the rest of the world. And the reason is because uh, in the US, defense um, are injecting a massive amount of money into, uh, into, into research um, that is related to experimental mechanics. And that's the reason the SEM is based in, in the US. And if you go there, there's, there's a massive amount of, uh, of work done um, in certain areas which are, you know, not very well represented um, in Europe. And also a reason why, you know, the BSSM is such a small um, society. And if you look at other uh, countries in Europe, um, there are very few experimental mechanics um, associations or societies. Uh, and when there are, they are a bit either dormant or nothing much happens. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that's caused by the funding landscape predominantly. And okay, you can sidetrack all particular calls to try to develop your research, but it's a bit, um, it's a bit difficult and tiring as well, because you, you, you always try to pretend that you're doing something and in fact, you're doing something slightly different uh, and you have to be very creative. But um, I, I think this also has its, um, its limits. And that's probably the reason why we lag behind in the way, I think, compared to countries like the US. I see that Oliver Duncan is raising yeah. his hand. You want to say something? Yeah, I was just so I was interested to hear what you're, you're saying there. For me. I recently joined the UK Metamaterials Network as part of their leadership team. And a lot of their discussion is actually around how to influence policy. 
and um, how, how to kind of take control of that. So rather than doing as politicians say, talking with them and communicating what, what the future kind of funding scheme is going to be around and what the, what the UK's targets are. Right, so I think you have a large enough group here to do that, so. Just following on from that, policy making and policy influencing is a, is a major deal. Uh, there's a big effort on that in UK universities, uh, engaging directly with government base and uh, Innovate UK and EPSRC and so on. It also goes on via the high value, say, uh, catapults, center system and so on. So there, there's a lot of lobbying going on and not always, say, everybody pulling in the, right, in the same direction because we have all our, our special interests. But there are, there are attempts and, and, and often quite successfully to actually have an influence. The thing about the politicians want to be accountable because that's that's where it comes from. I think it's part of this 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 philosophy of new public management that came out like thirty years ago, and so so politicians want to be accountable. So they want to seemingly want to have more managed research programs as opposed to free research or responsive research, as it's called in the UK. But actually, there still is is money in the pot for responsive research, and that would be one of the areas where really clever ideas for <clears throat> for for experimental techniques to be developed could be funded. They typically would need to have, say, a, some, some attachment, some, some, some connectivity uh, uh, link to, to some sort of application. Uh, that, but I think in many cases, that, that's not really an issue. It's more about trying to make an effort to, to find those connections and find those, those, uh, those, those users of this, this technology which could be over many, many areas. So I, I, I'm not as, as defensive or pessimistic about the future of this as, as it seems that we could have been. Uh, I think there's, it's, we just need to stand up to it and understand the landscape we're in. And we can, of course, try to fight the windmills and, and, and die and attempt to take them down. Or we can try to basically be clever and, and, and play in the system. I would advocate for the last thing. Also, not so negative that that you need to hook your or your proposal onto a societal uh, relevance. Uh, and actually, it, it's sort of like also um, uh, forms consortia that and and it's connections to to other kind of disciplines that that normally you wouldn't easily do because people actually are sometimes also actively pushed to to get to, for instance, I'm now just writing a project proposal that were really, we actively searched for, for a participant in analysis who could look at the, the really economic um, aspect, the potential economic aspects for, for, for the country. So so looking at somebody from a, a economy background, like a really, uh, and this is also interesting. So it it's, um, yeah, but, one thing I do see in terms of funding that becomes more and more difficult, I think, is that uh, it's, it becomes even more and more difficult to get funding for to for your lab, so uh, to, for equipment. That I see the funding schemes changing in the sense that there's only f uh, funds available for for personnel, and, uh, and basically you're supposed to have your your lab up and running and everything in there, and you can never um, Ask for a budget for maintenance and, and operational costs actually because like all of these these, these microscopes in my lab that you need to change them in well let's say at least 15 years so that's that's so you basically you're always thinking of how to scrape off some money actually to to uh, how to pretend that for instance that, that there's some uh, um, a lab technician that is uh, supposedly do, uh, doing some work on, on your project who is not, but then you know you can scrape off that money and you 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 can scrape everything together to 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 get you to to keep the, the lab up and running. That that I, I in in sort of like 15 years I've been doing this job, so not so long as some of the other panel memos, but I've seen a change at least in the Netherlands. There initially it was still more possible to. To directly write some some costs in there, and also more easy to get funding to to purchase uh, equipment specifically to projects, and uh, yeah, and that can for the future can be uh, become a bigger problem. I, I've also talked to other people, also from physics, and they, they at least in the Netherlands, and they 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 are um, experiencing the same trend. I don't know how it is in the UK, but uh, maybe somebody can comment on that.
I suppose we, we've touched on it um, already, but uh, you could say that the future of, of any subject, and especially experimental mechanics, lies in its um, early career researchers. Um, so would, would you, as the uh, panel members, have any advice for those early career, of which um, the delegates of this uh, conference, I think, uh, in a large part, uh, early career researchers? Um, is, there, is there any advice that you can offer to, uh, to ensure the well, survivability? Like, uh, maybe I can uh, offer the advice that I offer. Mo uh, actually, I've offered to a few of my PhD students um, after their PhD, and then they're, they're looking where to develop into. Um, so, and it hooks onto what we've been saying earlier that you need to have societal impact. So, um, if you want to have to, to establish an academic career, I think it's it makes it easier if you're sort of like uh, more in the direction where it's easier to, to, to make societal impact. So if you if you just do um, uh, almost any kind of PhD in experimental mechanics, even uh, large scale structure or whatever, but so you have a, a, a mechanics background, but then it's for instance a very good, often a good choice to for instance, do a postdoc and, and move a bit towards, for instance, biomechanics, where I think that the, the, if you look at the, the level of, uh, well, the, basically the, 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 there's so much more development and future there in the field like that, than, um, and, and much more opportunity, where you can see that in many different areas, they're looking really to, to uh, become more, well, the, 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 on two sides, the, the, it, it's more difficult to do, testing so that there's a lot more techniques and everything needs to be developed um, and on the other side they're finding more and more that just the mechanical behavior of, of, of uh, living tissue and, and is very important for all kind of processes um, so so um, may, my advice would be there to step out of your own uh, uh, little cocoon where you you might see that that there might already be a lot of, of colleagues do already working there and everything. And it might be very difficult to, to build up an ac academic career. While there, there are other fields where you, you can come in with your background with mechanics and really give added value. And maybe also um, are a bit closer to um, societal impact. So um, then like, like in our university, the, the, the research by the bi biomechanical technology um, department, which I was not involved at all, eh? so I can be objective about it, but they've been getting a lot of funding by research onto cancer, cancer cells, and, and that really involves mechanics a lot. Um, and, um, and so it's for them very easy to get societal relevance um, while they're doing mechanics. So they're doing a lot of uh, um, experimental mechanics testing and they're doing a lot of um, uh, um, uh, finite element modeling and combining this and this whole group. They're publishing completely different journals. Um, but yeah, if you can step out of your comfort zone, then uh, uh, that would be my, my advice. So just following up from that, so I don't necessarily disagree with what you and just said, but I do think that there are lots of, if you are working and coming from, from a more conventional mechanics background, there are plenty of areas that address societal challenges. Uh, fly zero, we, we mentioned already. Uh, hydrogen economy is part of it, the, the future transportation sector needs. In order to, to develop those new devices, propulsion systems, uh, energy harvesting devices and all that, there's a massive uh, testing needed to do that. And, 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 and smart design tests to, to qualify and validate such systems. And, and without those experimentalists there, it's not gonna happen. So, so I, I, I don't think we should write off mechanics entirely, but I do see that there, there diversity in what we can go and, there, and, and, and mechanics sits in many, many discipline areas, say as part of an intrinsic part of the physics of the whole thing. So yes, of course, and there are challenging experiments to be done there, maybe more challenging in many respects. So I think people should, probably try to follow their heart, their inclination, what they want to do and be a little bit courageous as well. It's probably a good thing rather than then playing it safe. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, the, 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 the progression, uh, say, uh, principles today are much, much more strict than when I was a PhD and then came on to be a postdoc. Uh, and nobody asked me about if I already published 10 papers. Uh, in fact, I published one. 
And, and, and today that would be seen as ridiculous for a PhD coming out, or at least maybe not in, in, entirely competitive compared to many others. So, so, so if you want to change your area, of course, there might be questions asked, uh, at least if you're a bit senior, what's your track record in doing that? Do you know anything about it? But if you have potentially then a technique that can be brought into this area, then you, you might have a, 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 a base for, for doing that. So I think, I think one needs to follow one's heart and inclination and, 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 uh, and find the thing that motivates you the most, because that's the only thing that really at the end of the day can drive you and help you get where you want to be. With that said, by the way, so uh, there's another question you can ask. Uh, uh, any, 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 any lessons learned from your own experience? So for me, it all happened by accident. So I wouldn't be the right one to, 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 to advise anybody about what you should do in your career. I think um, what you should do in your career is a, is a tough one. Um, the world has changed a lot since most of us made it to tenure. Um, I've been sitting over the past year on uh, recruitment panels for new staff. And I do think it's tougher to get uh, that first job uh, compared to how it was 20 years ago. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that they, they're wanting is, you know, we want to know what the outline of your first grant proposal is because the funding yeah. environment is so much more competitive. Um, you, you know, people are wanting to see what's your network of contacts. And I wonder about these poor PhD students, how they develop that in, in a year or two post PhD. It's difficult. And then on top of that, they want to know what are your connections with industry? <laughs> so I think as a, if you are finishing off a PhD and you're thinking about becoming an academic, it's probably a five-year plan that you need to make about how you're going to try to um, address some of these things to make yourself look competitive if, if an academic job is really what you want. And, and also um, to try and guess what in five years from now they will be wanting because the requirements might be different again. We just don't know. The, the, the world is moving really quickly. Um, so if you're truly dedicated to an academic career and you're looking around for postdocs, and I accept that not everybody has a choice, you go where the jobs are and what the job is. And the ideal job, of course, is one that widens your network of contacts, gives you experience in an area that is similar to, but not identical to your PhD. So you still have expertise to bring one where you can write a ton of papers, where industry are gonna give you letters of recommendation, and you have time to write your own grants or fellowship proposals. I don't know if jobs like that even exist, but if they do, you should definitely get one. Thank you very much. Yes, I suppose one of the best ways of uh, expanding your network and uh, um, engaging with industry would be to become a member of the British Society for Strain Measurements, of course. <laughs> that certainly wouldn't um, hurt, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, I suppose it's a very, we, we've only got a few minutes left, but uh, would there be anything that you would consider that the British Society for Strain Measurement could do to help with the future of the subject in which our core objective is to achieve in experimental mechanics? Or would we just continue what we're doing in the way that we're doing it best? I think Ole struck, struck on something quite important around whether or not we have um, influence politically in terms of setting the agenda for research. I don't know how we would do that as a society, but it's certainly something that we should perhaps be a little bit better at getting better at doing that kind of thing and not just the technical challenges. Um, I think we'll all drive the technical challenges forward just because of our passion and our interest in the area. But this other stuff that we don't often think about, which is slightly outside of our business as usual. So there are examples of, of societies with their existing out there now that are exerting influence or trying to do that by, 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 uh, by engaging with the political process and so on. And, 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 and with some success as well. I don't know, probably BSSM has not tried to do that. And maybe BSSM, I don't, I, I'm not sure if it's big enough to do that, but, but the IOM3 in the materials area and, and, and the British Society of Composites has been, has been proactive in some of those areas where they're trying to influence the agenda and that's ending up then with the industry-led organization, Composite Leadership Forum ending up with, with having say a say, not of course a determining say, but a, 
but a, but a voice at the table when, when strategies are rolled out. And so, so, so it's possible to do so. It requires a, a dedicated effort and some, some good wheeler dealers at the top table to get involved in that. But, but yes, it's definitely something that could be of interest. Mostly of those, those influencing things would, would address grand challenges in some sense, or the, the interests say, of an industry sector, for instance, uh, telling the politicians there's jobs involved, then of course they might listen. Uh, so, so it has to be in an indirect way for BSM, I think, that uh, it's a fantastic mm -hmm. techniques we, we have here. So we need to argue the case, why is that of importance to British PLC and, 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 and future that we actually get this in? What can it help to support? I think that's the storytelling that, that needs to be developed if, if we want to have that say, uh, to be more proactive than, than reactive. Definitely. Thank you very much. Right, I think I'm going to have to call it time now. That's been an extremely interesting debate. Thank you ever so much to our um, four panel members, Genevieve, Fabrice, Ole, and uh, Johan. Um, and I should have mentioned at the beginning as well, we did also invite um, J Professor Janice Barton from uh, the University of Bristol onto this panel, but unfortunately she's uh, unwell and hasn't been able to attend the conference. So uh, um, we wish Janice a speedy recovery. Um, but. Uh, uh, but thank you for agreeing to have been taking part. And thank you again once to all of the panel members for, for a debate, which I'm sure we could continue on and on and on if we wanted to. I hope it's been of, of interest to uh, the delegates here at this conference. It's certainly been of interest to myself. Um, and I, we now move on to the two, two parallel sessions um, in conferences room one and conference room two, um, uh, session 3.2a on fatigue and fracture, the third, the third um, session on that subject chaired by Dr. Katrin Davis uh, and then session 3.2b uh